friends, and welcome back to another episode of Strength for Today with your host here, Eric Dykstra. And today, we get to round out the week by looking at the last four characteristics between love and joy bonds versus fear bonds. And we've really uh, looked at the content and quality of our relationships. And this is one of the most foundational pieces to God and his kingdom is that relationship is so important. And I once heard a man once say, that uh, everything God does in this world is through relationship, and he never does anything outside of relationship. And so this is just some time, uh, this is just a, um, an area where I want to take some time to really help you understand the types of relationships that we have will really determine the quality of life that we get to experience and live out, because life can be brutal it can be hard. And if our relationships are not healthy, and they've been in relationships that have continued to hurt us, you can find yourself in a very hard and challenging place. And if that's the place that you find yourself in, I am so sorry that this life has been hard and challenging. And my prayer and desire is that you will begin to experience relationship the way God originally designed it and purposed it in our lives. And so let's just uh, jump in to the last four characteristics here. And I reminded you on uh, earlier this week that I'm getting these from a book called Journey Groups, uh, a relational model for discipleship. And this whole curriculum was really written by a good friend of mine, uh, Amy Brown. And uh, she just has some incredible insights in depth on aspects of our maturity of relational discipleship and heart to heart community. And uh, I've become very fond of these groups um, called journey groups that we are a part of that can really change us that create a sense of belonging and identity. Um, and it's why I've given a large part of my uh, heart and time right now to leading these groups. I've got some that are online and some that are um, uh, in person and hoping to get more in-person groups that are going and to be able to train others uh, in this area of cultivating a safe environment where we can be safely connected and live in bonds of love and fear towards each other and in relationship with God. And so Enough of that being said, and I just want to uh, get into the content here today a little bit. So go back to Wednesday and look at the first four. If you need to refresh it, that was part one. This is part two. So number five of a love bond is that the participants on both ends of the bond benefit. The bond encourages all to act like themselves. And so both people on both ends are uh, benefiting from the bond that is informed or being formed. And the bond encourages both people to truly act like themselves. And so what's the opposite of that? Well, it would be a fear bond and the participants on only one end of the bond gain advantage. The bond actually inhibits people from acting like themselves. And this is something that's so crucial and key that I've seen in my life, but also in the lives of others, is that when we are bonded in fear, we are often only looking to benefit from what I get out of a relationship. And when we are bonded in love, it's mutual that both of us get to benefit, both of us are encouraged and able to live from our true identity. And when only one person is gaining anything from it, the other person is left feeling like they've got to mask something or project an image or pretend to be something that they're not. So number six, in a love bond, truth pervades the relationship. So it's always seeking truth. And this is something else that's been dear to my heart um, for most of my life and recently is living fully in the light. And um, there's always things within us that are coming into the light and we have to live and posture ourselves to allow those things to be coming into the light and living in the truth. Because when things are hidden, 
and when things are swept under the rug and not dealt with in relationship, it often leads to hardship and pain and trauma and suffering that could be avoided if those things would have, if there would be a mutual agreement to live in truth. And so the opposite of that is that deceit and pretending are required. You see unhealthy relationships, there's a lot of deceit. There is a lot of pretending that is required. And this is often uh, James and James chapter one talks about this as far as um, being like an unstable um we is the word that is coming to mind that's being tossed and turned out on the on the water. And it's just kind of like we are unsettled, we're living from a divided heart. And there are so many things within ourselves that um, are still being hidden. And when they're hidden, you have to deceive other people. And there is lying that is involved in that relationship. So number seven, love bonds continually grow and mature people, equipping them to find their hearts. And I loved how she defined this is that um, love bonds continually to grow and mature people, equipping them to find their hearts. And so that's, if you go back to my core values and the very first bonus episode, that was one of my main ones was growing and maturing together and being in relationship should foster you to be able to grow and mature together and to find your true heart. Because when now when I'm meeting with other people and I'm always listening and looking for the ways in which I hear God and see God in their lives and can encourage them and build them up in who they are and who God has them to become. And in fear bonds, um, they are increasingly, they increasingly restrict and stunt growth, keeping people from finding their hearts. This is often found in the business world a lot today, and even in the political realm where, um, you know, that people are increasingly restricting other people and stunning their growth because they're only concerned with themselves, their own reputation, and they are willing to just bury the other person so that they might be able to look good. And a person can't truly find their heart. And when any time growth is restricted, or not emphasized, I'm always cautious. And I think it's a great sign and kind of a, a flag that gets raised up within us is that, hey, like if I'm feeling restricted or that I can't grow, um, there starts to become a fear inside of you of that person. And um, how you respond is, is you feel restricted and you either feel like, um, you know, you need to, to fight or you need to flight. Um, and those are just common, two common characteristics of that. When your brain is assessing of whether it's good, bad, or scary, um, you know, flight, fight, or freeze are the three responses that are often in that form of assessing what's around you. And when you feel restricted, uh, a lot of times we're not acting like ourselves because we'll revert back into that possum state where we'll avoid or um, we'll just shut down or we'll fight and go into predator mode where, you know, I'm only concerned about myself, but very little do we actually become the protector that God has called us to be in those times because we aren't living from our true heart. So the last one, number eight, Love bonds operate from the front of the brain, the joy center, and govern how do I act like myself. And in the next season, which is going to be starting here shortly, um, we are going to look at the brain science and how our brains are divided and how they function. But um, love bonds operate from the front of the brain, which creates joy. And this part of our brain is what gives us our identity and allows and enables us to act like our true selves. And so when overwhelm comes, we are able to still act like ourselves and not revert back to a less form of maturity that maybe we once had or were stuck in. Fear bonds operate from the back of the brain and govern how do I get how do I get what I want? So this is something that um, 
you see the contrast here is that if you're living from the front part of your brain, which is out of joy, you're thinking, how do I act like myself in this situation and see the person that I am with? Out of fear, you're beginning to act like, how do I get what I want? And this is an immature way of acting. And I'll be the first to admit, I've got a lot of ways. And that's what my first thought is. And that's why we're always in this process of developing, of growing. And the more secure attachment that we move into and towards with God and with other people, we are going to learn how to truly act like ourselves in every situation. And uh, our impact, our influence and leadership is going to go to new levels. And so that concludes the eight characteristics of the love and the fear bonds. I uh, just want to encourage you to go back and look at those in two resources that I've mentioned. Again, if you want to dive in deeper, uh, this is a great book called Journey Groups, uh, a relational discipleship experience. But this is meant to be done in a group and relationally. And, uh, you know, Amy Brown has created a great leadership community that I am a part of. Um, and if you, if you would be interested in leading those groups, being a part of one of those groups, I would encourage you just to reach out and I would love to share about how that could happen. I've got several groups that I'm leading right now. Um, and then there are also several other groups that are launching every month that you can be a part of to get to see it. And I really believe that you're going to experience some great change, transformation, belonging, and it's a really great way that if you've got a lot of these fear type bonds in your life to move into love bonds and attachment securely with God and with other people. And I want to close this episode and close this week by just sharing two other things that I've come across in the past year or two that have been really helpful for me. Uh, another great ministry that I've been a part of is one called Life Model Works, where they really help us understand the brain science of how God has wired us and the things that we need in order to mature and to grow into our true identities. And uh, they've got something, they did a seminar, uh, I believe if you go on their website, you could probably find it somewhere. But uh, they were talking about who we are. The Life Model Works is a ministry um, that really has, uh, has a heart to train the local churches and the um, church body, the body of Christ overall. But they give these five characteristics of five things that we need uh, in order to grow or in order to thrive. And I thought these were very helpful. And as I think back to my life, I can begin to see these kind of characteristics in the communities that I was a part of, and I'm so thankful for them. And these are just five, I believe, five characteristics too, that as you're looking maybe uh, to grow in this secure attachment with other people, I believe that if you have these five things around you, they will provide a great framework and structure for you to be able to really flourish and grow into this safe secure connection that God desires for us. Number one is to have a place to belong. Each one of us has this great deep desire. And at the very core of who we are, the deepest level in part of our brain is that of attachment, about being connected with other people. And the greatest pain that we feel in life is by feeling alone and isolated, that we don't have anybody. That's why I love my, one of my favorite names of Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. And I believe that when he came into the world in the form of a child, the reason it gave him that name was to reassure his people that he is with us, that he is with you today. So when you have a place to belong and you have a place where you're connected, so much comes alive in you and empowers you to live an incredible life with God, one full of joy that you can know and be assured daily that he's glad to be with you. Number two, to both receive and give life. You must have a place where you can receive life. And that's why I believe it's so important to be part of a community where you feel like these are my people. This is what it's like us to act like 
And that's why the church is so important. That's why having a local maybe house group that you meet with, a small group, are so important because you can receive life and you can give life to one another. You can't receive life if you're not in relationship with other people and you can't give life to other people without being in relationship with them. And number three, to mature as we get older. I love that aspect is just like physically as we grow up, we need to be given the things that are going to enable us to grow to that next level of maturity. Our bodies mature physically. We mature emotionally and spiritually as well. And so that you have a place that you can mature uh, is very important. Number four, to recover from the things that go wrong. This is something that I've been very fortunate to have. And I felt like as I've made mistakes in life and then times where I've been broken and needed healing, I have had people that have given me that space to recover. And I even shared last week of a mentor and um, director that I had in my life who provided me a context to step out of doing what I was doing in ministry in order to get healed. He was looking to protect me so that I could someday, again, uh, be back in ministry and not have to be burned out and wiped out by um, the, the daily grind of being in ministry. And so uh, a place to recover when things go wrong. And number five, to live from our true identity or heart. And if you've got these five characteristics, I believe that you're going to thrive. And because it was the way God originally designed us and the way he originally purposed us to live in relationship with each other. Now, I'll leave you with this thought this week. And I love this. This was from a guy that I had heard on one of Deeper Walk International's e-courses on discipleship. And if you go on their e-courses, you can look at the one they did on discipleship. And they had a guest speaker on there by the name of John Lynch. And there were a couple statements that he made and that were recorded in the notes of this e-course that I absolutely loved. And one of my deepest hearts and desires is to see these types of things happen and to create a sense of belonging for people so that they could know who they are, who God's called them to be and live it out. He said this about when he was talking about how he was nurtured into a heart-focused community. He said, we are all awakening to the pain of realizing that I can't control my world the way I thought I could. Stuck with unresolved issues whose symptoms I'm trying to fix, all without the help of anyone else. And some of those statements are just, if you stop and think about them, are just incredible. That we're all awakening to the pain of realizing that we can't control our worlds. Sometimes what we experience in relationship is outside of our control. And the things that happen are wicked and evil and cruel. And I know they've caused a tremendous amount of pain in some of your lives. And I'm sorry if that's been the case for you. And I've experienced pain in my own life. It may not be exactly like yours, but I think we all realize is that life, we can't control it. And the more we try, the harder it gets. And I think the more frustrated we live. And he says, stuck with unresolved issues whose symptoms I'm trying to fix without the help of anyone else. How many of us is that the case is that we're trying to solve and get through life on our own, feeling isolated? It's the wild, wild west mentality. I gotta make it on my own. I'm tough and I can get through it and I don't need anybody else. But Jesus clearly defined that we need each other and spend his whole earthly ministry reconnecting us with him and also with other people. And then he said this, what if there were a place so safe that the worst of me could be known and I'd discover that I'd be loved, not less, but more in the telling of it. I love this statement. If there was a place so safe that the worst of me could be known and I'd discover that I'd be loved, not less, but more in the telling of it. I loved 
just thinking about that statement about more of ourselves being known. And what does that take? It takes secure connection with each other, a willingness to be vulnerable and transparent. And by sharing our stories, we're not loved less, but we're loved more because it shows who we really are and what we're really experiencing. And when that happens, we are changed. And we are given permission and space to become something more, something beautiful. Because out of the ashes rises something beautiful. And I'm just seeing this image of so many of us who have been living in despair, who have been living in discouragement, coming into a community that is life-giving, that's giving us space to recover that is a place of receiving and giving life, a place to mature as you get older and to live from your true identity in a place so safe that even the worst of you could be known and you'd be loved more in the telling of it. And I want to share just one more thought from John Lynch where he said this, the objective is not to create communities appearing to have sin under control but for leaders to nurture a safe and real enough place where people can come out of hiding and let others into their sin and their failure. There is, uh, their sin loses power and we can be healed. Trust in Christ's redemption, forgiveness, and repentance. It's messy, but utterly healthy. Those who live in it become free. And as they learn to receive love, they sin less. So much of our life, I think, is trying to control the sin and trying to change our behavior by our own effort. But what we fail to realize is that through secure connection and receiving God's love, we are changed and we become like Christ in a natural way, where now Christ being formed in us defeats the power of sin in our lives. And we are not when we are not what we once were, but we are now new creations and given the power and the anointing and the grace to fully live into it. And having this desire that we create and nurture a safe and real enough place where people can come out of hiding and sin loses its power and we can be healed trusting in Christ's redemption, forgiveness, and repentance. And so let me close the week by just praying over us. Father, you're an amazing God. And I know that for many listening, they have very different experiences of how they've encountered relationships and what they've walked through. Some of us have gone through some incredible, wonderful, joyful relationships, and others have gone through being hurt, wounded, and had a lot of trauma come. And it's hard for them to trust and to build healthy relationships. And so, Father, I pray that whether this speaks life or is challenging or hard, God, that each one of us would embrace this message of understanding that relationships are so important to your kingdom and that your desire for us is to truly live connected securely with you. And out of that relationship with you would flow our ability to relate to one another out of love in creating a place of belonging for others around us. Lord, give us this desire to be known. Phrase that of, Father, we have a desire in us to be known, but Father, we need people around us that can help us bring this into the light and live in the truth. And I pray that as we uh, think about uh, being bonded in love or fear, that you would help us understand this, that you would help us to chart a course forward and begin to evaluate our relationships. And for some of us, we desire to change our relationships and to, to have new relationships that could strengthen us. And so, Father, I'm believing and hopeful and encouraged that you will provide those types of people where healthy relationships can be built and that we can connect with you at a much higher and deeper level. And it will empower us to become the protectors that you have called us to be, that Christ was, that he created a sense of belonging for those around him. So may we be that way as well. And may we become everything that you see in us. May we become everything that you've called us to be. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
I hope this week has blessed you. I hope it's given you an overview. And what I hope to do next week as you will come back and join me is just begin to just unpack this a little bit more because I know we covered a lot of ground. I know it was somewhat general, but hopefully give you some more tools next week to understand the importance of relationship and that you can be hopeful and encouraged that um, Jesus, more than anything else, wants to be securely attached to you. And he wants to make a way for you to feel that way when you're in his presence. So God bless and may his strength fill you today.